So today is the fifth Sunday of Easter. We'll be here again in Boise, in Fayette, Idaho. And the epistle for this fifth Sunday after Easter is taken from that of St. James, chapter 1. Dearly beloved, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if a man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he shall be compared to a man beholding his own countenance in a glass. For he beheld himself and went his way, and presently forgot what manner of man he was. But he that hath looked into the perfect law of liberty and hath, uh, hath continued therein, not becoming a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in, in, in his deed. And if any man think himself to be religious, not by debriding his tongue, but deceiving his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Religion clean and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widow, and the widows in their tribulation, and to keep oneself unspotted from this world. In the Gospel, taking that according to St. John, Chapter 16. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, amen, I say unto you, If you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in Proverbs. The hour cometh when I will no longer, no more speak to you in Proverbs, but will show you plainly of the Father. In that day you shall ask in my name. And I say not to you that I will seek, that I will ask the Father for you. For Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from the God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world, and I go to the Father. His disciples say to him, Behold, now thou speakest plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now we know that thou knowest all things, and that thou needest not that any man should ask thee by this, that we and should ask thee by this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Those are the words of today's holy gospel. And the Father, the Holy to men. So tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday are the regulation days, the days of asking. And on Thursday, as Ascension Thursday, the day that our Lord went up into heaven. And that uh, we have these days are the great days of asking, the days of prayer. So today, a few considerations on what prayer is. The word prayer simply means to beg, to beg, pray, sir, a blessing. To beg, to beg is what to pray is. And this is the time of prayer. And we are, of course, to pray at all times, but especially now when our Lord is about to go into heaven. Because it is a fact of life that when you ask something first and you ask something last, the most likely thing you're going to get is the thing you asked last just before the time of fulfilling requests. Because you may forget the thing you asked first, it was so long ago. But the last request is more readily kept than the very first request. And our Lord Jesus Christ is about to ascend into heaven. And he said, I go to sit at the right hand of the Father. I go to the Father, and there he shall intercede for us and his humanity. And so, therefore, we put our final requests. What do our Lord, Lord please, please ask for this and ask for that? And, and so we have great rogations or requests that we make of God. Tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday are the rogation days, which we will sing with the saints and go out and bless the crops. And we are reminded that everything that we receive is a gift from God. And that there is something sacred, there's a sacred part of man that is called prayer to ask. And prayer is something that only exists in this world and is only for this world. It is a very grave mistake that many souls make that prayer, the devil will tell you, that's for God, that's for heaven. But on the earth we have to work. But the reality of the real world is it's prayer that is what makes things tick. We must beg for what we want. We must ask for what we want. And when the fulfillment of our request is made, that is the answer to prayer. And human beings, prayers are only for this life. They are only valuable in this life. They are useless in the next life. The souls in heaven do not pray. 
They are already in heaven. They already sit in the face of God. And they cannot get a higher place in heaven. Nor can they go lower in heaven. They cannot increase in happiness nor decrease in happiness. They can't increase in glory or decrease in glory. And they can't lose any of the magnificence of God they possess. Nor can they increase it. They have absolute, total perfection. And there's nothing for them to ask. All prayer is for this world. So therefore, for instance, we pray to St. Anthony. St. Anthony cannot lose anything anymore. St. Anthony is perfectly happy before God. But St. Anthony can pray for us. And he can't pray for us after we're dead. He can only pray for us now while we're on the earth. So that it's useful to find your keys if you're alive. It's not useful to find your keys if you're dead. So the fact is that not only the finding of physical things, but the same is true of spiritual things. It's useful to find forgiveness when you're alive. It is useless to find forgiveness when you're dead. Prayer is for, it is the breath of this life. We, so we often compare prayer to breathing. That when there are many things that we do, our heart works, our feet works, our mind works, our eyes work. All of our parts work. But if there is no breath, if there's no coming in and going out of breath, then we are said to be dead. And so it is with our supernatural reality. The reality not as a supernatural life, but our life as human beings. Every man must pray. Every man begs. And that includes the Satanist and the saint. That includes the mediocre man and the fervent man. It includes the one who doesn't care about anything. Every man prays. Every man begs. The only question is, whom do we beg from? What do we beg for? Why do we beg? But every man begs. And God made it begging as part of our very existence. God wanted Adam, for instance, the first duty that God wanted man, Adam to do, God made Adam absolutely perfect. He gave him infused knowledge so that nothing was left out. But he wanted God, God wanted man to beg and this is before he fell. This is before the sin. He came to God and said, Lord, I want something. Lord, I really appreciate this beautiful world that you gave me, but I want a creature like unto myself. That God did not allow woman to be created except by prayer. The saints teach us, for instance, that between man and woman, it's easier for the woman to pray than it is for the man. Both men and women pray. It is more important for a man to pray than for a woman to pray. And yet it's easier for a woman to pray than it is for a man to pray. And the reason is because the reason why this, the reason why the beautiful creature that is the feminine part of the man, human nature exists is because man prayed. And all things that are good come from prayer. God said, Adam went and saw the beautiful world and he was very grateful for it. But he said, Lord, I beg of thee. I pray thee, give me a creature like unto myself. Give me something like unto myself. And here he enters the life of God by prayer. And then God was pleased that Adam asked for something. Therefore Adam was put to sleep. And his prayer was heard because it was a good prayer. It was a wonderful prayer. And therefore from the side of Adam came Eve, who was the first answer of the first prayer. And from that moment forward, prayer is part of our blood. <coughs> no man can be a man unless he prays. And the very woman's existence is prayer. That the woman is what a man desires, and that he, she is the fruit of prayer, and the man is the one who must pray. Hence, in the very beginning, God has willed that prayer be something that comes especially from man, because he must beg for whatever goodness comes to the human race must come from a man praying. Hence, as men only are priests, they stand before God and they pray and they beg. And when a man prays and man begs and he's prays in the night and he falls asleep in the night, God can bring the most beautiful things from his side. He brings the most wonderful blessings from his side. Prayer is the most wonderful of all things. It is our breathing in and our breathing out. And prayer is something that all human beings do and all human beings have in their heart. The only question is, what do we pray for? In the beginning, Adam begged for something wonderful. But then, what did Satan do? Satan came down and he told Adam, through the mediation of Eve, that you don't have all things that God should have given you, the knowledge of evil. 
God should have given you the knowledge of evil. But if you eat of this fruit, you shall receive the knowledge of evil. Do you want to receive the knowledge of evil? Yes, I do. And so he begged of Satan the knowledge of evil. And then obedience to Satan, he ate the forbidden fruit. And death came into the world. And wickedness came into the world. And it is true because Adam changed his desires. He changed what he prayed for. He prayed with the knowledge of good and evil before he knew only good. And so there is so the prayer is essential to both sides of supernatural life. The side that brings us to God and the side that brings us to Satan. For those that are the most wicked of souls, they sell their souls to Satan in order that they might get, like Queen Elizabeth, who now burns in hell. Elizabeth I. She burns in hell because she asked of, the, of Satan 40 years of reign. <clears throat> And she would serve him if he gave her the 40 years of reign. So she begged for wicked things. She begged for the things of this world. So prayer is something innate inside of us human beings that we are meant to breathe out begging for things. And so what is it that we beg for? Saint, Saint our Lord Jesus Christ says, Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. But now on, from now on, I want you to ask in my name. Because begging for something is you're asking from someone who is not yourself to give you something that you do not have. How do you get that something? You must do something that the one whom you beg from wants you to do. You have to show that you are worthy of the, of the fruit of the prayer. Hence, our Lord Jesus Christ said to the apostles, you must pray in my name. Hitherto you have not prayed in my name. Did you know that our Lord Jesus Christ said to, to those that pray, they say his name, but they don't pray in his name. For he said, whoever says, Lord, Lord, shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. So many say, Lord, Lord. And remember also, in hell, there is prayer. There is not prayer in heaven, but there is prayer in hell. In hell, we read about the wisdom, in wisdom chapter 5, of the prayer of the damned. It's called the prayer of the damned. And the damned say, we fools, we esteem their life, the life of the just, madness, and their end folly. But behold, thou, they have the gift and greatness, they have the, the, the lot of the saints, but we suffer. And what is it that the damned pray for? They pray for their suffering to end. And they pray for their life to cease. They pray for non-existence and suffering to end. And their prayer shall not be heard. Our Lord Jesus Christ said to Jeremiah the prophet, when he was tempted to feel sorry for the damned, and he began to think about praying for them. And the Lord God came down to Jeremiah the prophet and said, Pray not for this people, for I will not hear thee. The, the damned pray. And they are not hurt. The damned shall exist eternally. They shall never ever cease to exist. But they shall desire with an infinite and everlasting desire to cease <coughs> to exist. It shall never be hurt. Furthermore, they shall desire that their pain cease. But that pain shall never ever cease. And their prayer shall not be heard. And then what only shall their and he says, I, the Lord, shall mock when that shall come upon you, which you feared. You feared suffering in this world. Behold, now you suffer infinitely. You feared death, and now you are eternally dead, and I shall mock thee. That is what God says to the damned. Not only shall he not hear their prayer, he shall mock them, but they shall pray. Meanwhile, the just in heaven have nothing to pray for because they have received all the fruits and all the gifts of their prayer. Where is prayer valuable and where only is prayer of use? It is only on this earth. The most wonderful things that God gave us is the prayer and the spirit of prayer, because prayer gives life to everything that we do. And prayer cannot be heard unless we do something to make ourselves Make a master want to hear our prayer. And hence we have two prayers on Good Friday. We have the prayer of Gesmas, who now burns in hell, the wicked thief. And we have the prayer of St. Dismas, who is now a saint in heaven, the good thief. 
Now remember that these two men, they were most wicked on Good Friday, both of them. They both cursed God on Good Friday. They were both very angry about the fact they were being crucified that day, and they both specifically cursed Jesus Christ himself. But during the course of the day, they realized that this man was not an ordinary criminal, but he was called God, and he is called King, and he is a miracle worker, and he could answer prayers. Therefore, Gesmas said the first prayer, and he turned to Jesus Christ, the wicked thief, and he said, If thou be the Son of God, save yourself, save us. He wanted to be saved. This is the prayer of the Protestants who say that we want to be saved, but without good works. We want to be saved, but without changing our lives. It's a prayer of the charismatic movement. You want to be saved. You want to love Jesus. It's the prayer of the majority of Catholics who say they want to be saved, but they do not want salvation. As Bishop Sheen said, what did he ask for? What did he pray for? He prayed to be taken down from the cross. Whereas St. Dismas prayed to be taken up from the cross. One prayed to be taken down. The other prayed to be taken up. And what was it? why did the wicked thief want to be taken down? He wanted to be taken down to continue a few more years of sin, a few more years of impurity, a few more years of stealing, a few more years of wickedness to earn an even deeper death and a greater fire and a worse suffering in the eternal place called hell. That's all he wanted, to receive the, the reward of a deeper suffering that he should already receive. What is the point in hearing his prayer? And then he said to our Lord Jesus Christ, a mockery, save yourself, please save yourself. Jesus Christ does not save himself. He is in God himself. He is God. He is salvation. He does not save himself. And so the, the prayer of the thief was a blasphemy, to add blasphemy to blasphemy. So that St. Alphonsus would say, there are many men, Catholic men, 400 years ago, and they would die a Catholic death, but they did not love the things of God. And so when they were dying, they wept. And when they were dying, they prayed. And when they were dying, they called the priest, but in order that their suffering might be taken away, not that they might become saints, in order that they might have a few more years of sin, and not that they might turn back to God, but they pray, and they pray, and their prayer is another blasphemy to add to their punishment. But look at the case of the thief that is called St. Dismas. He also prayed, but what was the condition of his prayer? The thief recognized he had already cursed God, he already cursed Jesus Christ. But he recognized that Jesus Christ is innocent, and I, the thief, am guilty. And the first thing he did was he separated himself from Jesus Christ. Because one would look at a picture. You see one man, two men, three men crucified on a cross. There are three men dying. There are three men being crucified. So they are all the same. They are all called criminals. They're guarded by the same soldiers. So what's the difference between them? Gesmas saw no difference. But St. Dismas did. He recognized that this man is innocent and I am guilty. And therefore he said to Gesmas, the wicked thief, in preparation for his prayer, he didn't just pray. Remember, when the flood came and the waters filled the entire earth, for 40 days and 40 nights, there was more prayer on earth than there ever has been from that time until the day the world comes to an end. Everybody prayed, and they prayed with greatest devotion. Our Lord Jesus Christ did not hear their prayers. The time of prayer was finished. They did not hear their prayer. God did not hear their prayer. It was the time of their judgment, and that's the time they prayed. But they all perished in the flood. Not all would have gone to hell. Some may have repented of their sins, but they all perished. 
They all asked to live through the flood, and not one of them lived through the flood. Not one. Each one prayed for that, but their prayer was not heard because it was not the time. It was Their prayer was not heard because they had not constructed an ark. They had not saved two of each kind of creature. They had not spent the years in preparation for this great day of judgment. They just simply were mocking Noah during that time. And when the time came, their prayer was not heard. Hence, St. Alphonse says, those who wait until death to pray, <coughs> scarcely one in 100,000 shall be saved. That's his math. Those who wait until death. Everyone was praying. How many were saved? Now, what did St. Dismas do before he became St. Dismas? First, he separated himself from our Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, this man has done no wrong, but we suffer the just reward of our crimes. I suffer because I deserve to suffer. In fact, I deserve to suffer more than anyone is able to cause me to suffer. For I have offended God and am deserving of infinite punishment and I can only receive a small punishment here in this world. Therefore, I suffer what I deserve to suffer. He said the truth. This man has done no wrong. We suffer the just reward of our crimes. And then he prayed. And all he said was, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He didn't know what that would mean. But he did know that this man is goodness itself. This man is innocence itself. And that woman that stands before the cross is the queen of queens and the most wonderful of all. And only good can come if he just remembers me. I'm not worthy of anything else. Therefore, he said, just remember me. I don't know how you're going to remember me. I don't know what you shall think when you shall remember me. But I know that it must be something good because of what I see in this innocent man on the central cross and what I see in that most beautiful treasure at the foot of the cross. And then the Lord turned as much as he could because he was nailed to the cross. He said, this day, immediate, thou shalt be with me the most wonderful gift that can ever be received in paradise the most wonderful of places. He would not only be remembered, and this is what is the answer to prayer. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. This was the most wonderful prayer of the Gentile, and it took a thief and a murderer to say the most wonderful prayer of the Jew. The Gentile did not even have the true faith, but the Jew had the true faith, but he was living a wicked life. And what did he say? Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He recognized that there was a real kingdom that the Lord Jesus Christ was entering into. And that kingdom was more valuable than anything those soldiers had to offer. Anything Caiaphas had to offer. He was not interested in what they had to offer. Hence we read in the epistle today, St. James says, hold yourself unspotted from the world. Don't desire the things of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ says to his apostles on Holy Thursday night, speaking only to 11 of them, though 12 were in that room. He said, Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name, but from now on ask that your joy may be full. That's what he said. What is the result of prayer? Joy. The result of prayer is peace. The result of prayer is happiness. It is the most terrible thing when we cannot breathe. And when we cannot breathe, we are sent. It's over. What's a good old-fashioned way to see if someone's dead? Take a mirror. Stick it over his mouth. It doesn't fog up. Bury him. <laughs> and so what happens if the angels put a mirror over our face? Will it fog up? But if the Satan puts a mirror over our face, it blows a hole through it. We have so many desires that come from him. We want to be a millionaire when we grow up. We want to be successful in the world. We want to be very popular, etc. in this life. But what do the wise want? 
And one of the most wise women of the last several hundred years was St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. She knew that prayer was wonderful and only for this life. Hence, she had only one prayer. And her prayer was, out pati, out mari. Just four words in Latin. Either suffer or die. <coughs> That's all she said. Either let me suffer or let me die. And St. Thomas would explain her beautiful prayer. St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, she did not desire pain. She desired glory. She desired to be closer to the one that she loves, which is Jesus Christ, God himself. That's what she desired. She desired glory in heaven. She desired the presence of God. She desired to see him face to face. That's what she wanted. And how do you get closer to God? You can, how do you get closer to God? You only get closer to God by offering suffering to him. And hence she wanted suffering, not because she wanted to suffer, but because she wanted the reward that comes from suffering. She wanted the glory that came from it. And she knew what prayer is. Let me suffer that I might have a greater place in, happy, in heaven. Let me suffer that I might be closer to the one I love, so that for all eternity she'll be so close to him. And she'll receive such glory. And this is the right kind of selfishness. Because God did make us social creatures, but he also made us selfish. I want to save your souls. I do. But what's the point in saving your souls if I don't save mine? I want all of you to go to heaven. But I also want me to go to heaven. Therefore, whoever wants the good of others must also want the good of himself. And God made me to desire happiness. <laughs> To desire the possession of fulfillment of all desires. And desires are fulfilled only by him and by his presence. And hence the answer to all prayer was made when Jesus Christ said to that thief, This day, we don't want to be answering our prayer tomorrow. We want it now. This day, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Bishop Jean used to say, I always wondered why he said paradise, in paradise, because to be with him is paradise. That is all that heaven is. It is only to see God face to face. It is only to possess him. And so every time you receive the Holy Eucharist, it is a taste of heaven. Every time we consider the things of God, and he dwells inside my mind and heart, that is a taste of heaven. And this is what is paradise. What do we desire? We desire God. We desire the things of God. We desire eternal happiness. And then we desire those things that are going to get us there. And we want the happiness that lasts, where moth does not consume, where things don't get destroyed by the decay of these things of this world. We want something stable. Hence, prayer is the most wonderful thing. But we do not only pray for spiritual things. We don't just pray to go to heaven. We don't just pray to get to God. We pray for material things also. And God wants us to pray for material things. For he wants to hear our prayer. He wants to hear it. Like the father in the old 19th century song called Scarlet Ribbons. The father walked into the room and heard his daughter praying at bed, saying, Lord, please send me some scarlet ribbons. And he heard the prayer. So his daughter went to bed. And the father searched all night everywhere to find scarlet ribbons. And he did not sleep at all, but he couldn't find any scarlet ribbons. Then he returned in the morning. There were scarlet ribbons on her bed. But what does the loving father do? He wanted to find the scarlet ribbons, but he was so happy just to search. He was happy to just go and find, go wherever he could go to find those scarlet ribbons. Why? Because he loved his daughter and the great prince. And the great man who loves his bride, who loves his queen, he wants to go over all obstacles in order to achieve her, in order to get what she wants. He enjoys the journey. He enjoys the fight. He enjoys all the things that make him fight to get what the little one, what, her, what his beloved wants. And the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, God the Son became man, and he wants to go searching for the things that we want. As we mentioned in the earlier sermon today, Anthony was where he told people in his great, in great sermons. St. Anthony said, don't be attached. 
Don't be attached. And yet, Anthony had a book, a little book like this that he used to carry with him everywhere. And then the days of the printing press, it was a very valuable book, handwritten. In that book, it had quoted from sacred scripture. In that book, it had prayers he used to meditate upon. And he would carry that book wherever he went and slept with his head on the book, and he loved that book. But in the end, it was just a book. And the devil saw how much Anthony loved that book. Okay, Anthony, you believe in detachment? I'm going to detach you from your book. And a wolf came to the book of Anthony and took it from him. And Anthony wept and he prayed to God and said, Lord, I want my book back. And the angel came and made the wolf bring the book back to Anthony. You're not supposed to be attached, but he was attached to that little book. And God heard his prayer. There will be many times when we want things that are material. Lord, David said, Lord, how long must I suffer? How long this? How long that? The Lord wants to hear even our foolish requests. Because if we love him and he loves us, he wants us to have our joy be filled. And sometimes we like foolish little things. That's why our Lord Jesus Christ said, When I walk through the field, I shall not step upon the smoke. I shall not crush out the smoking flax. I shall not step upon the broken reed. Because there used to be little boys that were shepherds. And they would take a reed and make a little bitty flute out of it and play a few notes and it would break and they would throw it on the ground. When they had another one and break and they'd crush them in pieces. But Lord Jesus Christ said, my boy made that flute worth about 2.5 cents. And he would not step on it. And the smoking flax he will not crush. Because there are two sides of prayer. One is that we must beg of God what we love and what we want that our joy may be filled. And the other is Jesus Christ delights to be in the presence of men. And how does he delight to be in our presence? He delights to run to find the little thing that we say we want. He delights to take care of us. He said, Do you not know that the lilies of the field neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet our heavenly Father takes care of every one of them? Prayer is the most simple and most beautiful of things. It means to beg, and it means simply to lift our mind and heart to God. Now, God happens to be everywhere, so it must, shouldn't be so hard to lift our mind and heart to God. If we are in the deepest pit, the best thing to do is lift your mind and heart to God. Because what is it that the, that the, good, that the, the uh, prodigal son did that began his conversion? St. Bernard used to speak about it all the time. It says in one verse of the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 15, the day, the moment when the good thief began to become a saint. Another good thief, the, good, the, uh, the prodigal son, when he began to become a saint, he was in the midst of his pit, and he was in the greatest despair, and he was starving, and he was feeding the swine, and he had given himself over to all manner of sin, and he was despised even by his fellow sinners. But it says these words of St. Bernard in Luke chapter 15, and he came to himself. He came to himself. What happens when the thief, when the, when the prodigal son came to himself? He remembered the father's house. He came to himself and he remembered the father's house. And what came inside of his heart? In my father's house, there's food. I'm starving. He didn't think of heaven. He was starving. In my father's house, they have clothing. I have been turned to rags. In my father's house, the servants have comfortable quarters. I sleep with the pigs. I will rise up and I will go to my father and I will fall upon the neck of my father and I will say, Father, I am not worthy to be called thy son, but let me be as one of the hired servants. He prayed. What caused him to pray? He came to himself. And St. Bernard used to say, O oh, ye sinners, whenever you sin, you're not yourself. Whenever you sin, you're something other than self. That's why we mention often the prodigal son sermon in the retreats. The modern man is right when he says you must go and find yourself. Because the modern man doesn't know what he is. He doesn't know where he's from. He doesn't know his own existence. And so he's lost himself. He has lost his identity. Why? Because he's in sin. Because he doesn't know what he's supposed to know. He doesn't love what he's supposed to love. He doesn't serve what he's supposed to serve. And he was made to know, love, and serve. So therefore, he does not have any identity. 
but come to yourself. And he came to himself and remembered the father's house. And then he rose up and walked all the way back to the father's house. And the father did not let him finish his prayer. Because when the father answers our prayer, he doesn't just say, I'll let you be one of my hired servants. Men and women are very good at this. You said you committed adultery. You said you <laughs> stole. You said you didn't give any. I, I forgive anything, but you got to prove yourself. <laughs> you prove yourself, and I will forgive you. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not quite that way. The, the child came back to the father's house, and he said he was going to say his big, long prayer, but the father said he went and got the trusted servants. He went and got, he killed the fatted calf. He brought the most wonderful to feast. He wouldn't allow his son to appear dirty in the presence of all the others or humiliated. There he put on him the best robe of sanctifying grace. He put on his shoes that his feet may not hurt. He thought of every detail. And he brought his son with the most wonderful glory back into the house. And he said, Behold, my son that was lost has been found. He that was dead has come to life again. And the father rejoiced. So prayer is most beautiful because it exists only in this world. And it is only for this world. But its conclusion and its wonder is found in the next. For the prayers that are answered, the place that they are answered, it is called heaven. And the prayers that are useless, the place is called hell. Those prayers that are vain, they are found in hell. Those prayers that are wonderful, they are answered in heaven. And it is the most beautiful of place, that place where prayer is answered. So let's ask of our Lord Jesus Christ and His Holy Mother to teach us how to pray. And to lift our minds and heart to Him and beg how to get out of our troubles and how to get to God. For well, there is nothing more wonderful than prayer and the place where prayer brings us, which is called heaven. Pray with you all. Thank you, Father, and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen.